Hello, my name is Kay Wader. I'm curator of the Japanese diaspora collection at the Hoover Institutional Library and Archives and the editor of Fanning the Flames, Propaganda in Modern Japan. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Fanning the Flames speaker series. Our audience has increasingly global. In this our final session, we have taken your feedback to heart, many from our remote audience. We are pleased to present a virtual tour of the Fanning the Flames exhibition in the Hoover Tower. We also have an accompanying online exhibition website at fanningtheflames.hoover.org, which I encourage you to visit after the talk. In addition, our exhibition located in Hoover Tower is open to the public through July 15, 2022. Reservations are required, so please check the details for, on the website. We'd like to thank the director of the Hoover Institution, Condelisa Rice, for her support of the library and archives and our programs. We also like to thank the overseers of the Hoover Institution, our board of directors and other donors without whose support, nothing we do would be possible. Now, just a few housekeeping notes. At the end of the virtual tour, we begin our live panel discussion and Q&A. We welcome you to enter our questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen at any time during today's program. Now let's begin the virtual gallery tour. Hello, my name is Kei Ueda. I'm curator of the Japanese diaspora collection at the Hoover Institution Library and Archives and the editor of the exhibition companion book, Finding the Flames, Propaganda in Modern Japan. And I'm Marissa Ree, exhibition curation and design manager here at Hoover and the exhibition team project lead for the Fanning the Flame project. We are standing in front of Hoover Tower, an iconic building in the heart of the Stanford University campus and the home of the Hoover Institution Library and Archives. The Library and Archives was founded by Herbert Hoover at his alma mater right here at Stanford University in 1919, a decade before the U.S. National Archives was established. He was a visionary ahead of his time in collecting and documenting war-related materials. To realize his vision in our second century, we continue to collect, preserve, describe, and most importantly, make available historically valuable material about war, revolution, and peace in the world. And now, it's our great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual tour of the exhibition, Fun in the Flames, Propaganda in Modern Japan. As we enter the exhibition gallery, we are confronted by the introduction wall, which features heroic Captain Higuchi rescuing a Chinese infant from the battlefield of the First Sino-Japanese War in 1895. This is a detail taken from a woodblock print by Mizuno Toshikata. It sets the mood and the tone as we enter this new experience and begin to learn about visual propaganda in Japan, which appealed to the masses as accessible and affordable during the era of the Empire of Japan. From the vast collections at Hoover, we have chosen the Japanese popular arts because of their powerful visual messaging capabilities to offer you an opportunity to re-examine propaganda. Emerging in the mid-19th century, after a period of strict isolationism, Japan under the rule of Emperor Meiji began a series of modernization efforts that transformed the nation from a feudal state to an expansionist empire. Accompanying these changes, state-sponsored and grassroots commercial propaganda became an omnipresent influence in Japanese life. This exhibition explores how Japan catered to traditional aesthetics by employing popular arts as propaganda that created imperialist fervor. Throughout the exhibition, we will navigate through three major wars, including the First Sino-Japanese War in 1894-95, which was the first Japanese overseas military campaign in modern times, as well as the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05 and World War II. 
This first case dives into the topic of propaganda, which is a strong collecting area here at Hoover. Examples from a postal collection and children's propaganda introduce various methods employed to spread information that will influence public opinion regardless of truth. The major restoration of 1868 initiated a period of rapid assimilation of Western advancements and imperialistic interest. Artists applied traditional aesthetics and communication techniques to make uniquely Japanese media, even as Western technologies such as photography, lithography, and films became widespread. Popular formats such as Nishike and Kamishibai then became more than entertainment but key propaganda tools. But what is Nishike? What is Kamishibai? Our next cases review these unique Japanese media, beginning with Nishike literally meaning brocade pictures. They're multicolored prints made from a Japanese woodblock printing technique. This process begins when an artist creates a design that is then passed to a woodblock carver for engraving into multiple blocks, one for each color. The blocks are then turned over to a printer who adds pigment and aligns the woodblocks for printing to produce the final image that a publisher then sells. This multi-step group process could quickly produce large runs of high-quality prints, relatively inexpensively, for sale to the mass market. This technique gained popularity at the end of the 18th century, and by the Meiji period was in high demand. When combined with the late 19th century trend to publish current events, Nishikie became a popular propaganda tool. Prints began to dramatize the excitement of the latest inventions, events, conflicts, and celebrities, all while promoting nationalist messaging. The fervor for collecting these artworks peaked during the First Sino-Japanese War, and works flooded the market. Yet, by the Russo-Japanese War, consumer interest declined, and few war-themed nishikie, like the first blockade of Port Arthur, were created afterwards. Kamishibai which translates to paper plays, is a form of storytelling that developed in the early 1930s. It was such a popular entertainment that an op-ed published in the Asahi Shimbun in 1933 likened it to opium for children. Performed using a transportable wooden stage, the kamishibai itself is a deck of 20 illustrated paper cards. They are illustrated on the front with the script printed on the back. As you see here, the cards would be inserted into the stage and rotated one by one by the kamishibai performer, who would give a dramatic solo performance with sound effects and various voices to captivate their audience. By 1937, there were nearly 30,000 kamishibai performers across Japan, performing to a minimum of one million children daily. Kamishibai had developed into various forms by this time, most notably child-focused street and educational kamishibai. Yet, with the start of the Asia-Pacific War in China in 1937, which evolved into the Pacific theater of World War II, wartime kamishibai became a prolific propaganda medium targeting everyone. As we move across the gallery, we can begin to explore how these very different mediums were used to achieve the goals of propaganda for the Empire of Japan. Hero stories were common and popular method for delivering inspiring examples of the greatness of Japanese soldiers and encouraging the righteousness of traditional samurai values and patriotism. Here we present highlights of propaganda featuring these Bushido values and hero stories. The Meiji government abolished the privileges bestowed to samurai, the top 7% of the population. But many maintained their elite status. Many generals and admirals of the First Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War were in fact former samurai. Nishike from this time period almost exclusively cast the spotlight on generals as great heroes inspiring the masses. The story of Captain Higuchi, whether completely true or embellished, epitomizes the war propaganda trope of the compassionate conqueror. It uniquely symbolized for the Japanese public the notion that not only were their nation's efforts in the war respectable, but also necessary for the saving of China's future. Such a message aligned well with Japanese Bushido values. 
Interestingly, Bushido, literally the way of samurai, became better defined in Meiji Japan and was further propagated amongst the Japanese during World War II. Massive conscription from 1937 to 1945 revealed that Japanese military needed to tap every eligible man into service, and Bushido values helped them succeed. The unwritten code of self-discipline, self-sacrifice, respect, and responsibility penetrated the minds of many, this time through both true and sensationalized hero stories. The bombing raid of the fighter aircraft unit published in 1939 is a heroic fiction that tells the tale of Japanese pilots and their camaraderie. In it, pilot Sawa bravely lands his plane in enemy territory and rescues downed pilot Makimoto. Paper plays depicting Bushido values, like honor and responsibility as seen here, were regularly performed at schools, in military factories, and in towns and cities throughout Japan. To strengthen the connection to samurai ideals, this kamishibai even has the Hirosawa wield a katana in one hand. Before the 19th century, the Japanese imperial family was publicly invisible, emperors did not travel, and their portraits did not circulate. This changed with Emperor Meiji, who was thrust into the limelight as the supreme ruler of a modernizing nation. In this case, we first see the propaganda nishiki of Emperor Meiji. Many depictions of the emperor, whether in paintings, prints, or photographs, did not prioritize conveying Meiji's appearance or covering events accurately. Nonetheless, Emperor Nishike offered consistently recurring and easily recognizable sovereign figure as a stable beacon during radically changing times. This print by Toshu Shogetsu of Emperor Meiji and Empress Shoken visiting the 1890 Industrial Exhibition was made and sold two months before the exhibition opened. The practice of releasing imagery ahead of the event was typical for Nishike and akin to how movie trailers today spur anticipation. As was common for prints of the imperial family at the time, there are no labels identifying the people present. The visual context was enough. By the 1930s, depictions of the emperors were limited to photographs. Emperor Hirohito was considered a living god, and illustrations of him were perceived as profane. Out of this reverence developed symbolic representations of him that were easily understood by the masses. For example, depictions of the imperial palace as seen in Kamishibai were known to stand in for the emperor. While the emperor was not depicted in Kamishibai, many paper plays made reference to his importance. In the play Seven Stones from 1942, Kazuo wants to send a care package, known as Imambukuro, to soldiers, but his family is poor. Kazuo visits the imperial palace grounds and takes seven stones to send as tokens of protection for soldiers in the field. A year later, the surviving four recipients of the stones meet Kazuo, and together they return the stones and give thanks to the unseen emperor. This story emphasizes the bravery and sacrifice of the soldiers, the emperor as a divine symbol, and the idea that anyone can contribute to the war effort. Women were never shown in propaganda nishiki except when it came to the imperial family. Here, Emperor Shoken is depicted visiting the Yasukuni Shrine Memorial to war dead and wounded soldiers in hospitals, modeling the ways Japanese women could support their husbands and sons drafted for combat. Creating meishoe, meaning pictures of famous places, was one way artists found to incorporate the women of the imperial family into Meiji-era nishiki while steering clear of the censors. In this print by Utagawa Hiroshige III, the title identifies the location, while a placard hidden behind a lamppost displays the kanji characters kozoku, meaning imperial family, a surreptitious clue for the viewer. Kamishibai produced during World War II show a departure from women's relatively limited participation in prior conflicts. Every aspect of women's lives was used in the mobilization campaign. The placing of women in visible roles of patriotic service was a dramatic policy shift desperately needed by Japan as the war progressed and resources were depleted. New roles were promoted to women through kamishibai in order to help the war effort. 
In What We Are Supposed to Do from 1944, the narration speaks directly to the audience in order to rouse them to meet the demand of the war effort. Women take up roles in factories and in fire brigades putting out air raid fires and are warned about the dangers of spreading rumors. In Neighborhood Association from 1941, a group of children find solutions to help their neighbors supporting the war effort, including asking a mother to breastfeed another's baby as that person is busy working in a munitions factory. Not even a woman's body was off-limits to the propagandists. In this next section, we look at examples of one of the oldest propaganda techniques, dehumanizing and degrading the enemy. Depictions of enemies as different could subliminally encourage disrespect and make it easier to overcome inhibitions to do them harm. This is seen in the racially derogatory and violent Nishiki depictions of Chinese and Korean soldiers in the late 19th century. Yet enemy depictions of the Russo-Japanese War, which occurred only one decade later, are often respectful and show them as equal to the Japanese. In both scenes, Japan has achieved a victory, yet the Chinese generals are groveling old-fashioned looking stereotypes. In contrast to the Chinese, the Russians wear modern uniforms and have a balanced position at the negotiation table. This difference stems from Eurocentric views at the time. Japan was eager to show themselves as the dominant, most civilized Asian nation, on par with the colonizing powers from the West, superior to their fellow Asians, but equal to their Russian enemies. By World War II, Japan had moved toward more universally depicting enemies in derogatory ways, regardless of nationality, as seen in kamishibai caricatures of Allied soldiers and their leaders. These kamishibai feature depictions of the enemy in rather unflattering ways. In What We Are Supposed to Do from 1944, the cover features scrawny and deformed American soldiers, while other cards feature chubby satirical caricatures, of American President Roosevelt as Uncle Sam and British Prime Minister Churchill as John Bull. This information is a standard element of propaganda. In this section, we highlight arguably non-deliberate and deliberate attempts. In Meiji-era Japan, there could be seen across Nishike depictions of false battle narratives that emphasize Japanese prowess. However, there were also cases of pure misinformation, inaccurate details that arose largely from the limited speed of communication, coupled with commercial demands on publishers to produce rapidly. The first army advancing on Mukden from 1894 and by Ogata Gekko depicts a mobilization of troops to attack Mukden that never happened due to Japan and China beginning peace negotiations. Like most woodblock print artists, Gekko remained at home in Japan and likely based his work on written reports, photographs, or imagination. Unsurprisingly, inadequate information and the haste driving production occasionally led woodblock artists to make factual errors in their work. By World War II, this information was more steadily and strategically applied on the home front in an attempt to boost morale as the war dragged on. Even Kamishibai about how to guard against enemy disinformation included intentional lies aimed at bolstering national confidence in the war effort. The Kamishibai counterintelligence warriors from 1942 warns against the intelligence activities, propaganda, and conspiracies spread by the enemy and encourages the audience to remain vigilant. The play explains how spreading a rumor without fact-checking may result in assisting spies. At the same time, the play spreads its own misinformation. It states Japan remains well-supplied and that people should not be fooled by rumors about running out of soap and toilet paper. The depiction of children in Nishikie propaganda was incredibly limited. They appeared mainly in scenes of the imperial family that included the crown prince. In the 20th century, however, as authoritarian rule gained dominance, no citizens were off-limits as either subjects or targets of propaganda. Much of the propaganda kamishibai either depicted children or made for them, such as air raid shelter instructions and collecting materials to support the war efforts. 
A primary goal, however, was to have Kamishibai mentally prepare children as future soldiers ready to sacrifice their lives for the emperor. In the Kamishibai soldier play from 1944, a group of children play at being soldiers in the Japanese Imperial Army, each taking on a different role. Those with weapons are soldiers, others are nurses, and one even does logistics, thus preparing children to assume these roles in the future. The world is awash with propaganda today, and the tradition of incorporating it into Japanese popular arts continues in the mediums of manga and anime. Regardless of your interest, the global success of these mediums means there's a good chance you've seen some of it, whether as Gundam robots, Pokemon, or Demon Slayers. But are they propaganda? For the most part, no. Just like Nishikie and Kamishibai, In general, these art forms are popular culture and not propaganda. But like those historical formats, anime and manga can be used as propaganda by both official and grassroots creators. Today, propaganda is still used in mass media to influence audiences. It takes critical thinking to judge whether the media contains ulterior motives and underlying messages. Can you tell the difference between what is purely entertainment and what is made as propaganda? We invite visitors to explore themes of propaganda and interact with this topic yourself. A new online portal on this topic can be found at funningtheflames.hoover.org. Thank you for joining us on the virtual gallery tour. We look forward to seeing you at Hoover Tower. We'd like to thank Stanford Video for working with us to bring this virtual tour of our exhibition to reality. This video may be viewed in its entirety on our website, panningtheflames.hoover.org now. In our three-year journey, the entire project of Panning the Flames, which includes the publication by the Hoover Press, website, and exhibition, began in 2019 and continued during the pandemic. Now, let me introduce you to those present the teams that played a key role in the development of the physical exhibit. Joining us are Marisa Rie, Lohon Kuglier, and Lisa Wang, who will each introduce themselves and provide brief behind the scenes overview of their team's involvement. Let's start with Marisa. Thank you, Kay. Hello, I'm Marisa Rie, the Exhibition Curation and Design Manager here at Hoover. I was also the exhibition team project lead for Fanning the Flames. As one of the three members of the exhibitions team at Hoover, I have had the wonderful opportunity to work on all parts of this project, from working with Kay on object selection and interpretation, to conducting research, developing the website, crafting the gallery layouts, and ensuring an accurate and educational presentation of the materials in our collection. It's a lot of work, but having a supportive and dedicated team of colleagues here at Hoover makes it all possible. Now, we would really like to dive into some elements of our behind the scenes work by following the path of an object that is displayed in the exhibition. We've chosen this print here, Utakawa Kunitora II's Nishikie, Great Victory for our Navy near Haiyang Island from October 1894. Besides being a dramatic scene of Japan's naval prowess during the first Sino-Japanese War, we also, uh, we discovered during our research that it's not a typical triptych, even though it may look like one with its three panels. Instead, it is only half of the hexaptic, that is a print made of six panels. Next. The first sign that indicated something was amiss were the cartouches highlighted here in yellow. Traditionally though, certainly not always, these types of cartouches, which can contain information such as title, artist, and date, are placed along the right edge of the rightmost page of a triptych. Then we noticed the printing notes highlighted here in green were on the leftmost edge of the central panel 
rather than the left panel, as was common at the time. This would lead to the text to be covered when the panels are aligned properly, which was unusual except in the cases of six and nine panel prints. Next. Combined, these clues led us to learn the artist had created two triptychs of the same event that could merge together into one large battle scene. Our center and right panels are actually the two leftmost panels of the first triptych, underlined here in gold, and our left panel with the cartouches is actually the rightmost panel of the second triptych, underlined here in silver. Next. With limited time and resources, it was challenging to find what the full hexaptic would have looked like. Online, there are limited digital, digitized copies of this Nishikie. Uh, we were able to track down the full rightmost triptych on Gallica, the digital collections of the National Library of France. Next. Yet the only full depiction of the hexaptic is this very poor quality watermarked image from a private bookstore. When we splice together the different panels, we can imagine what the complete set would look like. This print's unusual story is why it was chosen to be included in the physical exhibition. It is a wonderful teaching opportunity to remind our visitors that not even woodblock prints are always what they seem. And so it was selected to be in our display case that introduces Nishikie and the woodblock printmaking process. Other pieces on display were chosen for their connection to the themes explored in the exhibition, such as depictions of the enemy or the promotion of Bushido values. But once we were aware of the unusual elements of this print, the exhibition team's next steps included discussions with our preservation and digital teams about how the piece would be prepared for digitization, the process and method of digitizing and including in our online digital collections, and the mounting of the piece for exhibition. Now I will pass you on to my colleague Laurent to learn more about the journey this Nishikie took before appearing in the exhibition gallery. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, Kay, for inviting us to this presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laurent Crevelier. I am the book and paper conservator here at the Hoover Institution Library and Archive. I work in the preservation department where I provide specialized input to help with practices and decision-making and I perform um, preventive and interventive treatments to make sure that our collections can safely and durably fulfill the mission of the institution. In the case of exhibitions, we make sure that objects are fit, stable, and look their best so that they can tell the full story they can tell. I didn't work personally on this specific exhibition, uh, but I can tell you all about it nevertheless, if you trust me. So when curators come to us with the idea of putting on display any object, our first reflex is to find all the reasons why they should. Um, most of the time it's because the object is damaged and too fragile to be handled, like these objects in the image right now from our collections. But there are other reasons why object can't sustain being on display for an extended period of time. And that can have to do with light exposure and fading risk pollutants in the air, vibrations. But we are here to make sure that an object can support a narrative in a secure and responsible manner for the long term. So our role becomes more about how are we going to make it work. And first, we assess the nature and the condition of the object. And the purpose of this um, research is to know if the object can be displayed, and if yes, how. Next. In this case, we have two main concerns for the woodblocks. 19th and 20th century Japanese woodblock prints are often printed on very short fiber papers that are similar to Chinese Chuan papers. Those become very brittle with age, uh, as you can see in these examples from another collection. That is nevertheless from the first half of the 20th century, so very close to us. Um, and then the inks and paints that are used in Japanese printing in the 90th, 19th and 20th century that are very sensitive to the lightest change in the environment. Some alterations are permanent 
especially for example with Prussian blues that are very pH sensitive. Uh, and most, most importantly, when exposed, the colors can fade quite quickly. So we prepare an extensive condition report with several exams and tests, not only to assess the state of the object, but also if the paper and the colors can withstand certain treatments. And we also take conservation images to be able to compare before and after treatment and before and after exhibition. And of course, we document absolutely everything we do at all stages. Next. Next, please. We come up with a conservation a set of recommendations that we share with exhibition and loans and um, about what the object will require to sustain being exhibited. That covers stability, mounting requirements, display time limits, and different objects can have different types of uh, light sensitivity and length of exposure. Environment requirements, that would be mostly temperature, humidity, air quality, and sometimes even a transport brief because some objects will not tolerate vibrations like pastels, for example. So fragility is not always obvious and it's not always where you can see it. Next, please. So preparing the objects for digitization first means making sure it is stable to be handled and displayed and make sure that its appearance is at its best possible according to its condition. We do not hide the age of objects, but we just uh, um, make sure that they, they, they tell the best story they can tell. And in this case, fortunately, there was not much to do because our princes are in such good condition um, but with other objects, uh, we usually do surface cleaning, as you can see here on the left, flattening, which often requires humidifying, and minimal mending according to ethical conservation guidelines. Then we pass along a handling and imaging recommendation set for the imaging team um, through our project management platform uh, with indications whether the item may need to be supported for handling. We also give surface and texture information that will influence lighting choices, whether the object can be imaged under glass or not, or if the dark or light background underneath may exacerbate certain features or certain conditions. And then we store the object in a transit room where the imaging team will have access to it. And then we remain available for them to help them if they need, isn't it so Lisa? Next. That is correct. So thank you, Laurent. And thank you, Kay and Marissa, for organizing this panel. And congratulations on such an exquisite exhibition. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Wen, Head of Digital Services and Systems at the Hoover Library and Archives. And today, I represent a team of photographers, librarians, and archivists, and many others who worked with the exhibition's curation team in producing the images that you see highlighted on the Fan in the Flames um, online exhibit portal and searchable on Hoover's digital collection site. Um, now, of course, digitization encompasses a wide range of activities, but today um, let's focus on some of the processes and, that influenced our approach to imaging um, this particular Nishikie print for exhibition. Um, next slide, please. Um, so when phot photographing cultural heritage materials, our digital imaging lab follows community accepted guidelines such as FAGI, and that's an acronym that stands for Federal Agencies Digital Guidelines Initiative. And this means we verify the performance of all of our imaging systems, we monitor quality control, and we maintain objectivity in the image making process within a closed feedback loop. Um, we use a variety of cameras, platforms, and equipment in our lab, but I'd like to share just a few of the tools that we used and technical specifications we followed during our imaging process, which you can see outlined in the previous slide. Um, if you can go back one slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the two that I'd like to highlight here are tonal reproduction. Um, here we evaluate, is the image too bright or too dark? Um, how does the contrast look? Is it linear? Is there any loss in the detail in the highlights or shadows? And the other one I'd like to highlight is sampling efficiency. How effective is the imaging system at resolving the expected spatial um, resolution? So next slide, please. Um, so as Laurent um, mentioned, the Woodbot prints have a very uh, highly distinguished color palette. Um, so in order to accurately reproduce the subtle tones and highly chromatic pigments in the print, we created a custom color profile for the camera. 
Um, a color profile is like a map, uh, a map that tells the imaging software how to convert electronic signals recorded by the sensor when a picture is taken into specific colors composed of different proportions of red, green, and blue light, or RGB. Um, so using a spectrophotometer, the device that you see on the left image, we measure the spectral reflections of um, the color target used specifically for making color profiles. And on the right, you'll see a graph that shows the individual spectra of every color represented on the target. So once the target is photographed, we use a software that builds a color profile um, by analyzing the difference between the reference spectra and the camera's RGB count values. And when we photograph the wood bark print using this particular color profile, it ensures that the colors and tones that the camera sees are accurately reproduced in the digital image. Next slide, please. Um, so we want to facilitate a digital experience that's authentic and closely mimics viewing the print in real life. Um, so this is our goal and approach to digital color management. So we use image quality analytic software um, to verify that our color and tonal accuracy of the reference target. And as you can see on this slide here, um, the circled area in the screenshot shows an average delta E or color difference of less than two count values. And a count color, um, a color difference value between one and two means that there is um, only a very small difference in color reproduction and only obvious to a trained eye when compared side by side. And we can interpret these results as a highly successful camera calibration. Um, next slide, please. So um, teamwork was essential throughout the life cycle of this exhibition project. Um, we worked um, hand in hand, literally and figuratively. Uh, for this print, our very talented lead photographer, Spencer, worked closely with Marissa to carefully align the triptych under the camera. Um, and while Marissa removed each plate from its folder and worked on alignment, uh, Spencer prepped the plexiglass with a brush, a hand air blower, and an anti-static gun before placing it atop the print to flatten it. Um, due to the image, um, the high image resolution, um, the camera's field of view is too small to capture the entire triptych in a single image. So it needed to be captured in sections and segments and stitched together using uh, Photoshop software. Um, next slide, please. Um, and here we've illustrated the regions of interest that overlap each image section. The green regions are at the center of each frame and surround one of the three plates. Ideally, we aim for about um, 30 to 50% overlap between the images. Um, and the blue regions show where the first and second sections overlap. And the red regions show where the second and third sections overlap. And as Spencer worked on stitching the image, Marissa prepped the next triptych for photography. And after a successful stitch in Photoshop, the plexi was removed and prepped again, while Marissa aligned the next triptych, creating a projection line approach to digitization. Um, next slide, please. And voila. Here you see the final image. Um, and next slide, please. Um, so as Marissa had mentioned earlier, this print was unique in that there was information printed where the left and center plates would normally overlap. We decided to pro photograph each plate individually um, to better convey the physicality of the item in its digital form. And again, sort of replicate what you might see if you were to handle the plates in person. Um, and next slide, please. And finally, um, here you see a few crops at 100% scale, highlighting the fine details captured in the print, the hand of the paper, the unique textures of the woodblock printing method, the chromatic reds, blues, and yellows chosen by the artist to tell the story. Um, so while the digitization story does not end here, I'll pause here. I'd be happy to enter any questions about the digitization lifecycle um, later. But if you have questions of, um, specific to cameras and to photographic techniques, um, next slide, please. Um, please reach out to Spencer, um, our lead photographer, whose contact information is provided on this slide. Um, so now I'd like to turn it back to Laurent, um, who will describe the process of installing the object in the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, next slide, please. Okay, well, when the time uh, for display comes, we mount the object on a support that will assure the stability of the object for the period of the exhibition. And we do have to take into consideration that we are in a seismic area here. For flat paper items, we have many options, whether we want to inlay the document, that is to insert it into a border um, of uh, a different paper, or hinge it to a mat, which is to attach it uh, using a little hinge made of Japanese tissue. And there are several kinds of possible hinges where they are 
made um, shaped like a V or like a T. Uh, we, uh, we usually say T hinge or V hinge. They can also be what we call floated, which is um, which appears that they are just floating over a piece of paper, but they are securely attached behind, don't worry. Uh, we can use corners, we can use strips, we can use threads, we can use a large variety of, um, of techniques and uh, the field is constantly uh, evolving. So there, we need to go and visit um, other uh, exhibitions to be um, aware of new um, hinging and mounting uh, ways. Um, and then uh, we can have a window mat or a frame. In this case, we have just a window mat. The important is to choose the adequate system uh, for the object and that all the materials that we use are acid free or some people refer as museum grade. Um, and off the object goes after we have mounted it and it is temporarily replaced with an outslip in its original box. Next slide, please. Here, the wood blocks are V hinged from the top. That means that at the top uh, of each one of the panels in several places, there is a tiny strip of Japanese tissue that is adhered um, with methyl cellulose and folded, and the other half is adhered to the back mount. Um, we chose to have a window mat here to uh, properly display and, and give an idea of the object as an object itself. But as you can see, uh, we have chosen not to cover the edges of um, the prints with the window mat. And uh, this choice has to do with showing the reality of uh, these woodblock prints, which is that they never exactly align with each other. There is registration uh, issues and there is alignment issues through several pages. And sometimes in, um, in books, you can find them uh, actually not exactly aligned because they chose to align the paper instead of aligning the image. Here, the choice was to align the image first, but then to still show the reality of how um, it wasn't exactly uh, corresponding to the edge of the paper. Uh, for objects sensitive to light like these, we organize object rotations and replace them by others or copies after a certain time. Uh, there is a, a standard in museums by kind of materials for what is called a just notici noticeable fade, which is a measuring um, unit that would be how you, the, the moment when you can notice that fading has occurred. And that just noticeable fade, one of it is allowed every 50 years. So that is how careful we have to be with how much uh, um, an object, how long an object has to be exposed and at which light intensity, because everything is of course measured. Uh, so we then regularly monitor the conditions inside the display case and follow up to see if the object is happy. Uh, and we also train invigilating staff to identify sign uh, of objects in need of assistance. And then to unmount the exhibition, we do everything in reverse. We just don't undo any conservation work that could have been done on um, every object. Next, please. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer later. Back to UK, thank you. Thanks to our panelists for taking us through a behind the scene experience. We'd like to uh, open up the panel for questions, beginning with a few we have received before the event. First, I address the first questions before turning to my colleagues. The first question that came in was, uh, how and why did, did these objects come into the Hoover collections? So these objects were uh, acquired in line with our mission as a war archive with strong collection focus on propaganda. At Hoover, we acquire collections both through donations and purchases. The next question is, how many woodblock prints are, are there in your collection? How did you decide what to include in the exhibition? So we currently hold uh, 58 pieces. 
it's a growing area and we focus on five themes at the exhibition. So women, Bushido, hero stories, emperor and disinformation. We selected these pieces that best tell the stories of these themes. And last question to me is, how many prints did each run produce? So approximately each run produced uh, 1,000 prints. Compared to today's social media, the reach and the size of the impact were rather local and limited. Woodblock prints were essentially like today's posters. And as you can imagine, many did not survive for various reasons, including World War II. So what we have in our collections are historically important material. Now, um, turning to Marisa for a question. Um, what are the object, uh, are the objects in the exhibit also in the book? That's a great question because we would love to be able to show everything in our collections related to this topic of Japanese propaganda in the modern era, but there's never enough room. So a lot of the material in the book is in the exhibition and vice versa, but it's not a one-to-one -one at all. Fortunately, we did have the opportunity with this project to create an online website and have a majority of our collections related to this topic featured there. So if you're curious what else we have, I highly suggest you visit that. Great. Um, another question to you, Marisa. What was the most challenging part of putting this exhibition together during the pandemic? It was definitely not being able to be in person with both my colleagues and the collection material on a regular basis. Um, as you all know, we were trapped inside at our own homes and uh, we had very limited access to the Hoover campus during a majority of the time we were working on this project. So we had to be creative about things. Um, and especially getting material either looked at by preservation or digitized, that required very hands-on work. So it was pretty tricky, even trying to figure out the measurements for each print, which very slightly so that we could design the layout was a difficult task. And looking at um, the proofs for the book, we actually all had to meet up on campus outside because the buildings weren't open and on a lovely picnic table, spread out all of the different printing proofs to see what would work and what wouldn't. So it was a challenge. Definitely. Um, so now it's for you, Lisa. What type of lighting was used to photograph the woodblock print? Sure. Um, as as Levant had mentioned, the pigments are very sensitive. Um, so uh, for these particular woodblock prints, we use strobe lighting. Um, so unlike continuous uh, light sources like LEDs, um, the flash duration of the strobes during each capture um, is really fast. So it's about one one thousandth of a second. And so we use these to minimize the amount of time that the delicate pigments would be exposed to light. Um, thanks for the question. Great. Um, another one for you. Um, where can I view other objects digitized for this exhibition? Another good question. Um, as Marissa had noted, uh, fanning the flames at um, the exhibition site uh, online portal is, is probably the best part to launch from um, to, to look at the images. But more than 1,000 images were also digitized to support the rest of the exhibit. So I encourage um, visitors to visit digitalcollections2.hoover.org. And there you can search, you can browse, you can download and cite the images. Um, the images are also available in a IIIF viewer, if that's a familiar um, a technology to you. And this allows you to view and manipulate the images quickly and very easily. And so with the IIII manifest, this also allows you to um, compare and combine world bug prints um, and other um, images, not just available at Hoover, um, but as Marissa had mentioned um, earlier, sort of at Gallica and other repositories throughout the world. Um, so um, I encourage you to visit our digital collection site as well. Thank you. Great. Um, so a question to Lohan. What happens if the print is not in good condition? How would you repair woodblock prints? Well, thank you for this question. And it's actually <laughs> my biggest frustration with this presentation is because generally conservation loves to show before and after pictures. And in this case, they would have looked pretty much the same. 
<laughs> but um, generally, uh, the, the kind of damage uh, that happens to uh, woodblocks that are included in books or in triptychs and that are um, sometimes overlapping and adhered together comes from handling most of the time. And uh, um, most of the time it uh, like tears uh, from the edges. So we uh, use actually more Japanese tissue, um, which is uh, tissues that are made with uh, kozo fiber, which is a very long fiber. But the, the big advantage of Japanese tissues is that they are extremely light for a, 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 a very high resistance. And we also use uh, Japanese uh, methods to prepare adhesives uh, like with starch paste or more modern technologies like methyl cellulose um, and sometimes other, um, other cellulose ethers that we mix with solvents when the object would not allow water treatment, water-based treatment, and if the, if the pigments are water soluble, for example. So we have to do tests on every single color uh, uh, in every place to adequate the treatment to uh, the repair. Sometimes also because of climate, uh, uh, the uh, prints are very, they have been exposed to mold at some point in their history and they become very, very thin and very, very brittle. In that case, they need lining. And so we can do either very interventive Japanese lining techniques with a wet object or a, a bit more moderate um, approach with a drier uh, lining, which is called spot lining, with, with which we put the lining tissue on the back and then we just spot glue with tiny little dots over all the surface. So it's, it's a lengthy process, but in this case, really, it was a breeze. Great, we're very glad to hear that. Um, now, um, another question I think I might be able to answer. Uh, Kamishiba is still in use today. Kamishiba is actually becoming popular again in Japan, particularly after the uh, Fukushima nuclear disasters and other natural disasters. They are used as a portable, uh, interactive, and personable tool to communicate with children, reminding them of how to prepare for natural disasters and in not forgetting about the experience. In the US, I've, I've seen some cases where uh, some schools are using Kamishiba as part of the create, creative literature curriculum. So uh, I guess the popularity is not completely gone and it's coming back. I think partly because of its personal touch, create, you know, create creative additional uh, elements and um, interactive uh, performance. So um, the next question is to you, Marisa, how are kamishibai made? Um, so it's not nearly as intricate a process in many ways as the woodblock printmaking. But uh, originally when Kamishibai first started gaining popularity, they were hand drawn by artists and hand lettered with scripts on the back. But as production and popularity geared up, and especially in the case of all of the print uh, Kamishibai in our collection, um, they're all printed using a chromolithography uh, to be able to mass produce these and spread them out all over the country and even at times into some of the areas Japan um, had invaded at the time. Great. Um, I have one more question that might, I might be able to answer. It's the Meiji era or first Sino-Japanese war, the beginning period of the history of Japan in this exhibition. Um, that is correct. This a uh, Basically, the 20th century is the focus of uh, Hoover Archives uh, collecting policies. So for this exhibition as well, we, we started from the Meiji era, the uh, beginning of the modernity in Japan. Um, I think we have maybe two or three minutes to just go around uh, the panel. And if you have any additional comments, would you like to start, Marisa? Uh, just to add, to that question too. I think the earliest piece on display in the physical exhibition is from about uh, 1880. Uh, in the publication, we actually have earlier pieces than that. And um, you can see the breadth of the collection on the website. So I just want to throw that in. 
Um, so do you have any comments to add after that or? Um, so this was a long exhibit project, but it was really fantastic to work on it. And uh, I think I just wanna say thank you so much to all of the colleagues here at Hoover who helped with it. It really does take an army to put on a show like this. And our exhibits team is just so grateful to everyone and especially to UK for having the idea, the ambition and the drive to make the project happen. Thank you to you. Um, Laurent, do you have any additional comments? Well, I, I wanted to say that despite not having been involved in the early stages of this, uh, of this project, I became involved as it goes and I will obviously be involved in unmounting the uh, exhibition when it comes. But I have to say that it is one of the reasons why it's so nice to work in uh, at the Hoover is not only the collaboration between all the areas uh, that have tremendous technical knowledge about their areas specifically, but also the context around every object that we work with. And so that's, that's, that has been a tremendous uh, experience. And this presentation was a cherry on top of the cake. So thank you very much um, for having us. I will just uh, uh, share in the chat room two links uh, if someone wants to go and look forward uh, on how to make um, woodblock prints. Um, those are, is one very uh, old documentary, but extremely well made. And another one from a very reputable source on uh, how you print actually from the woodblocks that you have. So if you want, someone wants to go and dig further, I will just share those, um, those links in the chat room. Thank you again. Great, um, Lisa? Um, I would also like to echo words of thanks and gratitude to Kay, Marissa, the entire exhibitions team, and the entire Hoover Library and Archive staff who've, who's participated through the entire life cycle of this exhibition. It's been a journey and it's been an adventure, but the, it, the output has been so, so tremendously rewarding, um, working with the people, the objects themselves, and the stories and the context connecting past and present. It's really been a rewarding experience. So um, kudos to the entire team who uh, might be on, um, on the Zoom right now um, and um, who might be watching later, but um, it's been a true pleasure to be part of this project. So thank you. Thanks again to our colleagues for a great presentation and discussion. Um, I just like to say one more word of th uh, thank you to the contributing scholars who made the uh, Panning the Flame Propaganda in Modern Japan publication possible and their inspiration and energy during the pandemic were really such a um, uh, resources for us to move forward. So again, thank you very much. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us and please remember to visit our exhibition in Hoover Tower before it closes on July 15th. We'll continue to feature our online exhibition at fanindaflames.hoover.org. Our next exhibition will be Bread and Medicine, Saving Lives in a Time of Famine. It will open in early fall. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and we look forward to seeing you again at a future Library and Archives event. <laughs>